Hello, everyone. I know many schools are starting that countdown towards the end of the school year here. I hope that you finish strong over our last few weeks. This is going to be a fun week of AI learning. On Saturday, I'm excited to share my moonshot for AI and education at the AI for Education Summit. This is a free virtual summit. So if you haven't already, I would highly encourage you to sign up. I think it's a great day of learning, whether you're an AI beginner or an AI enthusiast. Share with your friends who normally don't get to take advantage of professional development during the week here. I'll give you all a quick sneak peek if you're listening to this episode. My moonshot for AI and education is that this decade will be remembered as the birth of superhumans because of AI. Join the conference on Saturday. And after you hear my full take, let me know if you agree or let me know if I'm out of my mind or let me know if it's somewhere in between. After I share my moonshot at the conference on Saturday, I will also be sure to post it here as episode 56. So you can check out, check it out on our channel as well, in case you aren't able to make the conference. Speaking of sharing at conferences, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to share a presentation on my favorite AI image generators, one of my favorite topics to discuss when I talk about artificial intelligence. In this presentation, I talked about how to use them, best ways to create AI images, and what should you use them for? The session received very positive feedback, which I was grateful for. So I wanted to share the full session here with you all this week as you look for creative ways to bring fun team builders or enhance your presentations with visual guides over the next few weeks here. If you stick around at the end of the episode, I also shared three of my favorite resources for creating the best AI images, a bunch of guides with the best words for perspective and artistic style. If you want to continue supporting the podcast, you already know a rating, a review, a share on social media, or a recommendation to a colleague go a really long way in helping to amplify our space and host bigger conversations. If you have any questions about AI image generation, feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Join the conversation at the AI education conversation.com. Finally, if your school, your district, your organization, you're ready to explore AI and make a change. I am available. I got limited availability though this spring. It's starting to book up, but I do have a little bit left for workshops, for consulting at the AI education conversation.com. Humans at the heart of education. I hope to see you at the conference. I hope you like my moonshot and I will see you next week. All right, perfect. Well, thank you all so much for this time in this space. I'm really excited to just be able to share a little bit around of a topic that I'm really interested in, which is just unleashing your inner AI artist. And so just for a little bit of context before we really jump in here yeah uh, just pause my music here real quick just get hyped getting ready getting our creative juices flowing and so just to give a little bit of context of where i'm coming from how i'm entering this space so i'm a lifelong educator who has recently been really really passionate about ai and just to give you some context of on my journey i would say that over the course of my career for the most part i've actually been highly skeptical of technology in education. And that's because in my roles as a teacher, sometimes too in my roles as a counselor, I feel like there was a lot of times where like I personally experienced just being burned by technology and, you know, seeing a lot of technological aspects that were supposed to my supposed to make my life easier in the classroom or when I was advising students as a counselor was supposed to make it easier. And it just didn't feel that way. And so when oftentimes when I hear cases of like technology coming into education, naturally, I think my blinders would go up a little bit there. When I heard also about AI, I was really thinking it was something like this. So I was thinking very clunky robots where, you know, they're around. Yeah, I know people are working on artificial intelligence, but it's a clumsy robot. That was my understanding of what AI was if you were to ask me 15, 16 months ago. All of that changed for me as it did for a lot of people. Uh, 13 months ago, when I was on my winter break from uh, my day-to-day -day work with One Goal and supporting students. One Goal is a national uh, college access nonprofit. And we had our winter break time and I played around with this thing called JetGBT. It just completely blew my mind what it could do. Uh, I was be I was able to ask it a lot of questions related to the work that I was doing. You know, and like most people, naturally my head gravitated towards use cases like lesson planning or developing agendas or those types of things. And I was just fascinated by its ability to create something that felt very useful for me as someone who was working with students on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I started to drink the Kool-Aid. I feel like over the over the course of that break that I had, along with just the journey I've launched since then, I have 
spent so much of my personal time outside of my day-to-day work with one goal in developing a podcast called the AI education conversation. Fun fact, Dr. Neka McGee, who is a part of the steering committee for day 29 has actually appeared on the guest twice. And we've had some great conversations around AI and education. So if you're in, would highly invite you to uh, check out some of the episodes you might be interested in, in wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Spotify, YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, but I started to drink the Kool-Aid and I started to really get this deeper vision of how I thought AI could be an education and the role that it can play in helping, helping everyone really make their jobs easier and transform the experience for students. So I know a lot of times when folks are thinking about AI in education and they don't have much experience, they tend to fall. Thanks so much, Akiko. Appreciate it. They tend to fall within some of these three buckets is my experience. If you, if any of these pictures resonate with you, if, you know, if, if picture one, which is around the cheating resonates, throw one in the chat. If two around, you know, this, this idea that AI is going to be terminators that just take over the world and exterminate humanity. If you hear that or have thought of that, throw a two in the chat. And then lastly, I think the thing that I hear oftentimes from educators or folks is AI is just really complicated. It's complicated. You got to know coding. You have to know all these things to be able to use it well. And so, you know, feel free to throw some, some numbers in the chat related to, you know, the perceptions of the mindsets that maybe you've experienced, or, you know, some of your colleagues experience, but these tend to hear in my day-to-day -day experience, when I'm having conversations with folks who haven't uh, spent as much time playing around with AI tools, these tend to be some of the things that I'm hearing from them around their initial perceptions around AI. So, but today though, that's cool. I just wanted to set that preamble so we're all on the same page, but today's all about creating images. And I'm really excited to get into that. When I think about some of the pieces of AI that get me most excited, AI image generation, I think is so fun. Anybody who's a fan of my podcast will know that I am frequently generating AI images that I'm including in my show notes, and, you know, even my podcast cover, some of the images that I've created there are AI generated. So I'm a really big fan of AI image generation. I think there's a lot of very applicable use cases, probably to our day-to-day -day work that we could be using to generate AI imagery. And so that's our, that's our big goal for today. Our big goal for today is to harness the power of AI, to add fun visual components to everyday situations where they might come in handy. You'll notice too that throughout my presentation in a couple of spaces, I will include the prompts that I use in AI image generators to generate some of the images that you've seen here. 99% of the images that are used in the slide deck are AI generated. So again, I practice what I preach here. So just before we get into that, just to make sure we have a common understanding of what gen generative AI is, just in the, in the slight instance that some of you may be joining and don't have a deep context around artificial intelligence, maybe this is your first introduction. We're, def we're definitely going to uh, jump into a lot of concrete here, and I'm hoping to get into a little bit of discussion as well as some collaborative components with everyone here. But just to make sure that we are scaffolding this experience just a little bit, when I talk about AI, generative AI in particular, what does that mean? Well, let's. Uh, the way that I would approach it is chat GPT in particular has been very helpful for me in understanding and defining what that is. So I asked it that that was a prompt that I put in here. This was the definition that it gave me. If you're looking to understand what AI is, generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that can create new content, such as images, music, text, videos, by learning from vast amounts of existing data, mimicking, keyword there, mimicking, it's not actually human. It's not in you know any consciousness or anything like that, but it mimics human-like creativity and innovation. In case that de definition feels too daunting, let's talk about another thing. I then can ask the prompt, explain generative AI to a five-year-old. And in case that this definition is also helpful, that's a little bit about what it gave back there. So generative AI is like a magic art box that can draw or write new stories and pictures just by asking, what do you imagine? So hopefully that feels like a helpful context into what we're about to do today, which is really leaning into the image side of this experience. Just as a helpful comparison point too, I followed up and asked ChatGPT, how would you compare uh, the way that um, generative AI works to a real life everyday situation? It compared it to a chef. It said in the same way that a chef will have multiple ingredients and those ingredients can be different depending on the restaurants that you go to, but a chef is gonna take the multiple ingredients that it has around and take different quantities, volumes of those things, and then use the infra the uh, parameters that they have, in that case, their experiences to put together to make something very exciting and interesting that it outputs there, such as a hamburger. And But if you eat a hamburger and you go to seven different restaurants, that hamburger could be very different based on the ingredients that it have. So that's a comparison that it, that it gave for me this is also an AI gen generated image. So again, just continuing to show, we're gonna put quite a few visual guides uh, throughout this. That actually brings me also to my first AI use case already for how you could be using AI generated 
images throughout your day-to-day, -day, which is visual guides. So you can use it a lot for storytelling. You can use it a lot as a visual guide to support some of the points in a, in a slide deck or presentation that you might be creating like I'm doing here. So very helpful because of the fact that you can hyper-personalize what the image looks like and what the experience is there. So already got your first use case. Okay. I'm hoping that I don't, I won't have to continue to talk at you, at you for an hour. That's not my goal. That's not my style. As a teacher, my goal was always in a 60 minute period to spend 10 minutes talking and then a lot of time just discussing and having collaboration. I know that this format's a little bit different, but I'm hoping that we can create a similar type of experience over the next 50 minutes so that you feel like you're really walking away with tactics and strategies to be able to generate AI images here. But I'll also show along just in the event that you were not able to do so. But that being said, I would love to do actually to model my second use case, which is icebreakers and team builders. I'd love to just do a team builder with everybody in the chat today and, and have an opportunity for us to work on this together. So the question I'd love for us to explore is what's your spirit animal? So, you know, and then as an example here, you could see I generated even a picture of a mouse who's adoringly looking at a big wheel of cheese. And so some of you might resonate with that right now if you're like, oh, yeah, I'm really hungry, too. So that definitely feels like my spirit animal. But if you are able to, if you are able to do so, or you're on a laptop, you're on your phone, I have a QR code. I also have a tiny URL. I've created a Jamboard. And it would be helpful, I think, if you pulled that up just now, but if you're not able to do so, like I said, if you want to follow along, that's okay. But in just a second here, what we're going to do is I'm going to briefly show you three very popular AI image generators, and I'm actually going to do this activity based on my spirit animal, one that I would generate based on this, and then I'm going to add the picture to the Jamboard. That being said, I know I'm talking to a lot of, of, of AI pros who've, who've been, been around the block here a little bit. So if you want to engage in this activity, if you're like, well, I already use AI image generators and I'd love to just participate in this, I invite you to do so. So if you want to start adding your images to that Jamboard now, you're welcome to do so. If you want to follow along and you want to understand how these things work and then do so in just a little bit, that's cool too. So whatever is going to be your, your way to enter this conversation, I want that to work for you. So that being said, I'm going to jump to a couple of different screens here, and then we're going to start talking about how, how to approach this activity of what's your spirit animal here. So I'm going to start with ChatGPT just because it's my favorite. Now, just to make sure that this is it. So I just switch, switched my screen. NECA, Shannon, somebody, can you just confirm that it you can see the switch in my screen from the slide deck? I just want to make sure that I'm seeing that correctly. Can anybody confirm that for me? Yes, I'm writing in the chat. So. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> yes, So you great. can see it looks good? Okay, beautiful. Thank you very much. I just want to confirm, make sure we're all on the same page here. All right. So that being said, when you go to something like ChatGPT, so now I want to just throw in a quick caveat, which is with ChatGPT image generation, you do have to have a plus account to use it. But I know many of you, you might actually already have a plus account since you're you you know you're entering these spaces of thinking about what AI can do for you now. So I want to be able to show how it works. If you know this is something that looks very exciting to you, obviously I would invite you as well to consider getting a plus account, but I'll show some alternatives just in case you're not interested in doing that. But with ChatGPT, when you do have a plus account, when you, t when you type in something here, if you're very explicit about wanting to generate an image, it's going to be able to do that. Whereas the normal account doesn't do that and doesn't have the capability. The normal one will give you a prompt that you can use in an image generator, but it won't be able to do that. So I've been thinking about this a little bit since it was my question. And I think for my spirit animal, oftentimes because of my last name, my cousins and my family and I, we have this uh, kind of inside joke that Lopez, we always think of ourselves as wolves because Lopez in Latin or something like that means like sons of wolves. So to, oftentimes we tend to compare ourselves to wolves. And so something I've also been thinking a lot about lately is the fact that, you know, health has been a major priority for me. I just had uh, my child in the last few months here. And so I really want to set a good example for him on my health journey as I'm going through. And a big part of that has just been rucking. So anybody who's really under their health journey, you may know what that is. It's just essentially you load a lot of, a lot of weight into a bag and then you just go like on a big long walk or a big long hike. And it's just a good way to, you know, increase your cardio, increase your strength in your body. And so that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. And so I'm going to generate an image in the spirit of this right now, because that's been top of my for me. So I'm going to show you how to do it on ChatGPT first, then I'm going to show you how you can do it on Canva. If you have Canva, then I'm going to show you how you can do it on Firefly. So first and foremost, so ChatGPT, the way that I might frame it is I might put like generate an image. I'm going to show you how to do this first, then I'm going to show you different ways that you can make it even cooler. So let's do generate a comic book style image of a werewolf. Let's do a werewolf. That might look kind of cool. Standing 
on two legs with a big ruck sack on his back, hiking up a mountain, the big werewolf has a little werewolf walking alongside him. So I might start with something like that and then we'll see what it gives us. You know, it's all experimentation. So let's see what happens. So I'll start with that prompt. And if I like what it looks like, maybe we'll just work with the first one. And if I don't, I'm going to give it feedback. So on chat GPT plus, what you'll notice is it's going to have this little dial wheels. It says there it's where it's creating the image. This is not what will happen if you don't have the plus account, as I was saying, but because I have plus, it does do that image. And you'll notice there's no extra chat or anything separate. I have to do it goes within that. Oh, that's already a pretty cool picture. To be honest, I kind of like already <laughs> made me look really strong there, which I like. <laughs> so this is what it generated. And you'll notice just based on that simple prompt that I gave, gave big brawly werewolf there with the big rucksack standing on two legs, as I specified there's mountain features. And then there's also a tinier wolf. And the wolf is also looking up. I really like this, to be honest. So what I might actually do at this point is I might just copy this. And for my AI image uh, challenge, so what's your spirit animal? I'm going to just throw that in there so you all can see it if you're interested. You're welcome to use leverage that picture however you want. But that's I'm going to submit that as my chat GPT, what is my spirit animal, just so that I can show you what these other ones look like here. Now, if I didn't like this picture... What I could then do at this point is I would start to iterate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm not going to go too down that because later we'll we'll talk more. But if I didn't like it, that's what I would do at this particular stage. But just so that we can show you what other ones look like. So that's ChatGPT. Very simple. The thing I continue to love about ChatGPT is the interface is just so easy to use. You can't get easier than having a search bar and then just asking what you want, whether it's image or text, all in the same place. Now, if you go to Canva, Canva works a little bit different, and I'm going to talk about some of the features here that are different. So in Canva, when you're working on this, you want to find just kind of a white piece of paper or whatever design you want. I think this, this could apply to any type of design that you have. I know many of us are familiar with Canva. So just for the purpose of this, I just picked like a standard size here. And then what you're going to do is it's going to look a little bit different. When you go to Canva on the left-hand side, you actually have to go to apps. And then when you go to apps you're going to go to charts or you can go down to popular and you're going to see, you're going to notice that magic media is the most popular. That's because Canva has actually invested a lot of resources in adding generative AI tools to things that you can do on Canva. Now, the reason I'm I'm highlighting Canva here, even though I, I think that the quality is a little bit different from Chad GPT is because I know if you're an educator Canva, you can get it for free, right? So this is just a way that you can create add some AI generated capabilities without having to invest, you know, $20 a month or something like that if you're not going to use it as frequently. But when you go to these apps, you'll see Magic Media. The nice thing is once you have used it once, it'll start to show up at the bottom. And then, so wherever you click on it, you just click there. And then you're going to notice very similar to ChatGPT, gave me a search bar. Now this looks a little bit different though. You're going to notice that they actually have scaffolded the experience a little bit more different here because they did include style. They explicitly called out different styles. I didn't do as much about the styles in that first ChatGPT one, but I'll show you differently how you can do that. I, but you'll notice I did put an artistic element, which was a comic book style image in the prompt that I included there, though it didn't explicitly show it in the same way. But you'll notice these are all the styles that they have. They have quite a few different ones. And depending on the vibe you're looking for, you can click that. You don't have to use it though. What I've also learned just in my experience using this is that you can put keywords there and it'll work off that as well. So let's go back and just for the sake of continuity here, let's use the same exact prompt we used before. Let's do a comic book style one. But instead of the comic book style, I'm going to take out that verbiage. And then what I'm instead going to do is I'm going to just pick one of the, the filters that they have. So I'm going to just put a werewolf standing on two legs, but the same one that I had before. And uh, what style would be cool? Let's do the anime one. Anime one seems kind of cool. I'm very into cartoons in case you haven't noticed that between all my <laughs> artistic ones here. <laughs> so we'll see what it does. It's going to start to generate very similar to Chad GPT. I put in the prompt in that box. I click my style. I hit that and you'll notice it's loading. And then it's actually going to give me four options at once here. Uh, relative to just the one like ChatGPT did, which is also a feature that's a little bit different here. So I could work on one of these as an example. This one might be okay. Now you'll notice though that it didn't do it precisely how I wanted. Now let, let me spot check and make sure that the prompt was right. And yes, it was. Only one of the images actually gave me an additional werewolf in there, but none of them made it like a little werewolf. So 
that's again, that's just a good example of how these things aren't hundred percent accurate, right? So there's not always going to give you what you want. Sometimes you have to be a little finicky in the way that you're prompting to do it. But this is one example of what it could look like. I could refine this a little bit further if I wanted to, but I do want to make sure that we get to some of the other elements. But this is an example of like the quality that you could expect here from Canva for some of the images that you have. And so I'm, I can also take that. I think I can easily post that in our Jamboard here so that we have it in case it's popping up. I'll do that in a little bit. I can snipping tool that and add it back, but that's Canva. So it works similar. The last one that I wanted to highlight is Adobe Firefly, similar to Canva. In the beginning, I know that there's like a trial period where they will give you a certain number of credits to be able to use this in the way that you want. And then, you know, you'll have to like pay afterwards. I know a lot of people though, like Adobe products because of things like Photoshop, which, you know, some folks are created to. There's also some high quality filtering that is very helpful here. But that being said, we'll just get into it so that you can see what I see. Uh, we're going to use the same prompts just to kind of standardize across that. So the prompt that I initially done, generate a comic book style image of a werewolf standing on two legs with the big rucksack on his back, hiking up a mountain. Big werewolf has a little werewolf walking alongside him. I'm going to just hit generate. Then we'll see what it comes up with. Now you're going to notice on the right-hand side, this is kind of like Canva with some of the filtering options on steroids. There's just so many more things that you can do in terms of the styles, in terms of some of these pieces. Man, these are already pretty cool. I like these a lot too. So, but this gives you a sense of some of the qualities for some of the ones that you can have. But, and you also notice for the content type, it correctly gave me art. I think if it would have tried to do a photo, it might've looked pretty weird where they would have probably put a wolf head on a human body or something like that. I could also increase the visual intensity and you'll notice that it'll give me a different effect. You can also change the aspect ratio, which is something you can't do on some of the other ones. So if you were, if you're tired of always getting the same square photo that you get on chat GPT, you can make a widescreen or a portrait or something like that. And it'll give you just the different size. So just out of curiosity, I mean, we could do a wide screen, wide screen. And then let's also try increasing the visual intensity, which sometimes I think can add a really cool filter to the picture. And then let's generate this again and see what happens. Just to show you how you could be a little bit different here. Mm -mm -mm. And then very similarly, as I was mentioning, you can pick a different styles filtering like you can on Canva. You see how visual, like how much more, like visual intensity, I think is the correct way to describe it. You see how crispy some of these pictures look. So I really like that aspect of Firefly. I think the customization, if you're somebody who it's really important to you to have like extreme control of your pictures. I, I think that this is probably the strongest one that I have found to date in doing so. So like this one, I think is pretty cool. I really like this one. This one is like calling to me. So I might, add, you know, include this one and just in a little bit, I can add that later so that if you want to see it on the Jamboard as well, that you can. So I'm seeing a couple of folks do that. I appreciate just seeing your Jamboard picture. I see like a wolf in here too, which is really awesome. So if you want to include some of your, your pictures here, now that you understand how to do it, you're welcome to do so. I would invite you to do that just because, hey, the best way to learn some of these tools is just going to be to try them out, right? So if you liked one of those three tools I used, whether it was ChatGPT, whether it was uh, Canva for educators, or it was Adobe Firefly, check it out. Just start typing your own prompts, okay? And so that being said... Oh, the dolphin one is cool. I see somebody put a dolphin one in here. That's beautiful. I love that. So we're starting to get some of these in here. And you're welcome to use my wolf picture in any way if you want. Obviously, I'm putting prompts uh, in here as well so that you can kind of see how I was able to create certain pictures. So hopefully, if, if you are still increasing your, your proficiency in developing AI-generated images, you feel like you'll have a stronger command on how to do that as you are working through whatever your favorite image generators are. Let's go back to the slide deck just for a second here. I'm going to move on to the next part of this, which is I'd love to just see a couple of comments here in discussion. So I don't I don't know if the comments show up in the the Zoom or if I have to go to the lobby to see this, but you know, if anyone was wanting to share some of their reactions, I'd love to just hold a little bit of space here to to be able to process that. So I think my my really my question for you all is as I was doing that, like what came up for you? What are you noticing? Like, is there anything that you noticed about how you can generate AI images? how you might use this in the context of your work. So just any reactions to the little bit of a walkthrough I did there. And so I'll hold a little bit of space just to, for us to react and you know share some of the reactions here. So some positive responses around the generators. The verbiage and AI images seem to always be gibberish, but the visuals remain. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I feel that sometimes, to, you know, to that point, Diana, I'm like typing messages and I feel like I'm being very explicit about it. I'm asking, it's still not giving me what I want. And then I'm having to think real hard 
And it, you know, the equivalent for me is it almost feels like the same when I was an English teacher and I was working with the student who was just not understanding the lesson. It was like, how do I explain this in a way that they're going to understand? And it can feel very similar to that in some ways uh, when you are working with some of those AI generators. Yeah. Surprised with the quality. I know some, they, they could be really nice. Yeah, totally. Um, interested in knowing how multiple images of the same character use it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I can talk about what I do know there of how to do that. And then I also see this other question of like, is, is there one you prefer over the others? I would say generally speaking, chat GPT tends to be my favorite just because I think the quality is near the top of the list there. Now Firefly, I think because of the extreme precision that some of the tools offer, I'd be willing to bet with somebody who like really knows what they're doing from like an artistic perspective is using Firefly compared to chat GPT. I think they could probably create images that will absolutely blow us away relative to that tool, just because of the command that the tool brings. There's also a, a filter that you can add for images on Firefly to make it like a vector filter so that the image it gives you actually will continue to look really nice as you scale it. So in the event, you know, you wanted to use it for like a portrait style size, and then you wanted it to be as big as a, you know, a massive picture or something that it will still look nice, which is really cool. I would say that my, so to the question about, you know, generating multiple images, I will say that part of the challenge there, especially when using AI tools like ChatGPT to do it is there's this thing called temperature, right? And temperature essentially is something that is leveraged as a part of these tools where they essentially are not wanting them to give the same standard, same standardized exact response, even if somebody gives the same exact prompt time and time again, right? So if I entered that wolf prompt and then I now take the exact same prompt and I put it in again, it's going to probably give me a different different image because of the way some of the temperature is set. Some of the most helpful tactics I've seen people use when they've done things like children's story and wanting to do is trying to be extremely precise with the main character in that. So being very explicit, if it is a person, you know, their ethnicity, their, Jeff, their general age, their attire, their hair, you know, are they wearing glasses? Those types of things I think can help you get generally like a, a similar archetype of an image that might be very precise. Sometimes too, I think I've had mixed success with saying things like use the exact same character as this one and generate it again. I think something else you could also try is say generate a comic book style panel. And I want this panel to have four panels and I want the, the character to be exactly the same in all four images because now you're producing it simultaneously. So I have seen instances where that will actually help with giving you a very similar lurking character across like four different panels there. So those are just some examples of ways that I've seen it happen successfully there. And so would would continue to just invite reactions, comments in the chat if there's anything coming up for you here just seeing a lot of love for some of these image generators here. And we'll continue to ask questions and answer questions throughout, you know, some of the time that we have here. So just to make sure that I'm continuing through this, I want to actually offer some additional tips for image generation, just in the event that you're at the start of your journey, or you're actually really trying to do some sophisticated things here related to that. So I'll definitely make sure that this slide deck gets shared. You know, I'll share it with the steering committee and they can share it throughout because I did include a lot of spaces where I put links and things like that, that I think will be helpful. Just little tools and cheat sheets that I have found very useful as I'm developing like my own verbiage around what I want images and things to look like. But that being said, some high level tips I would recommend for image generation. You will notice that I modeled some of that there. The first is make sure that any prompts that you're using for image generation now fluctuates a little bit depending on the type of the one that you're using, but I'm really talking specifically around like tools like chat GPT that don't give you the ability to like pick your artistic style tools like mid journey, firefly, you know, uh, Canva, they, you can all do that, but you can't on chat GPT. So you have to be explicit about it. If you want it to look more cartoony, you have to say that. If you want it to look comic book style, if you want it to look Pixar animated, if you want it to look like a very high quality 4k video shot or image. You have to be very explicit about the artistic style that you want. And then you want to combine that with your subject and be as descriptive as you can, right? So if you just put, you know, I want you to generate a teacher as an example, I want you to generate a picture of a teacher teaching a classroom. You may find that the response it gives back to you is it may give you students that look like high school students. The school may look like a very 1940s classroom and the teacher, you know, may, may look like an art teacher and have, you know, flowery designs or something on the dress. And you may like, you may, you may think to yourself, well, that's not the image that I had in my mind. So you want as best you can to think about the specific image that you're looking for and trying to be 
as detailed as possible with all of the things that are very important to you to see in that picture. If there's very important pieces around the attire, the texture of an animal, the color of an animal, any of those types of things, just make sure you're calling those things out so that the chatbot understands what type of image you're trying to produce. I also find that related to artistic style, sometimes being able to include things such as the the, the vibe or the message behind something can help with the overall artistic tone. So as an example, I oftentimes am very interested in generating what I call cybernetic apples, <laughs> which are just like apples that look very robotic and machine-like. But I will oftentimes say something like, you know, generate a high quality image of a cybernetic apple. Uh, for me, I want the image to look very vibrant and I want it to highlight the intersection between artificial intelligence and education. And so I kind of provide some of that messaging so it understands a little bit of the vision that I'm trying to capture when I'm trying to generate something like that. Beyond artistic styles, some of my favorite artistic styles personally. So some of the, the keywords I'd highly recommend, pop art, comic book, Toy Story animation. My favorite one, to be honest, and this was this was one that I found as I've been working through this. If you want like a really high quality, like almost 4K type looking picture is just put like generate a film still photograph and then of whatever you want. When I first like learned about this prompting style, I was like generate a film still photograph of a gladiator or a 1980s DJ. And I just loved how it looked like the style. It kind of has this like HD feel, but still has a little bit of a filter on it. That's personally like my favorite one to use for like a more hyper realistic style to use. But again, would invite you to use whatever words you want. My favorite tone words, vibrant, bold, engaging, high quality, thought provoking, simple. The second thing I would also really just lay down here beyond just the composition there and some of the words you could use, I think it can also be helpful sometimes to generate ideas and then your images. And I can actually model a little bit of what this looks like. So let's say that you are thinking about a lesson in class or something and you're not really sure how to use it. What you could then do is let's say you're going back to JetGPT. You could say, you know, I am a science teacher and I am teaching a lesson on inertia, give me five image generation prompts of everyday examples, which could show what inertia means. So you could use it to do something like that as an example. And you can really quickly see how you could, you know, this type of prompt structure probably could help you regardless of your job if you're not a teacher. I mean, we all have roles where we're going to have to simplify and explain things to people who don't understand what our concepts, right? So this, I think, general structure or this this brainstorming experience could work there. And then you could see it's working now to give me some of these five ideas. Now, sometimes what I do is this, or I'm walking into an image generation. I actually don't have a strong opinion on what the picture looks like. And so I actually need support with the ideas. So I might now read the ideas and look and base it off of that. But sometimes I might, I might also be like, oh, all these ideas sound good. So I would say now, and this is something you can do here that I don't know that you can do in the same way on Canva and Firefly, though I will say I haven't tested. But I could say now generate all five images. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to work to generate images around all five of those prompts. Now, what is lost in me doing it this way is, as you can see, I'm not generating and I'm not communicating any of the artistic style. It's only the subject. But at this point, I'm pretty open to it. Like, I actually don't even know what I want it to look like. So I'm curious to just see what it gives me. You can see this is the first picture it gave, like almost a hyper-realistic, but still a little bit of a cartoony feel to generate an inertia, the, the foot kicking a soccer ball as it kind of like mentioned there. And then now it's working through some of the other images. Oh my gosh, <laughs> somebody getting hit by a car. That's that's really uh, intense there. So, but it seemed to be this the same type of style there when I'm looking at this. So it, what it may have actually done is taken the same artistic style and generated it over all five. But at this point, what I'm really doing is I'm not going to take the one of these pictures at face value, what I would probably do is just look at all five and say, like, which concept do I like the most? And now let, let me refine it further. That's how I generally do it. But, you know, if if this is sufficient for your needs, you're like, actually, this is great. Like, I already like this picture. Great. Take it and you can keep going. <laughs> so whichever kind of works for you. But but the thing I like about this too, not many people know this, you don't have to just generate one image at a time. Like you can generate multiple images at a time. And you can see now it's actually working through and, and giving me some additional context of the images that it generates in addition to showing it. But 
this is just a strategy you can use. If you need help with brainstorming pictures, you're like, oh, I need some visual guides for an upcoming lesson, but I'm not really sure what I want them to look like. This might spark an idea of where we go next. I would say personally, I would probably design the lesson now around as sports or something based on that first picture. I think that's pretty cool. And then I might actually try to design some lessons around what are some other maybe athletic examples in sports uh, that might like really uh, resonate with students. They might really understand that uh, to show inertia. So that would just be my initial thinking based on these ones that that I saw here. All right, cool. So wanted to just give some of those. Let me. And as I said, once you get this slide deck at the bottom here, you're actually going to see a few of my favorite resources for this. Now, like I said, I host the podcast. So I did a whole episode on image generation. So if you are absolutely loving this, in addition to lit, you know, listen to this recording, if you have some colleagues in your network where you're like, man, I know you would have so much fun doing image generation and they weren't able to make it today, would obviously highly invite you to, to uh, share this recording with them. But you can also encourage them to check out my podcast because I do a series called AI Essentials as a part of the podcast where in about 15 minutes or less, my goal is to explain a concept in AI that'll help folks increase their AI proficiency. So I break it down there as well how you can use some words to generate images very simply. And then I show some examples there as well. And in addition to that, I'm also linking three of my favorite cheat sheets just to give you a sense of what these look like. If you click on one of them here, it's just a bunch of uh, words that you can use. And it all shows, show you examples of styles, which can be very helpful. And so big shout out to, you know, all of the folks who were developed these Alicia Bankhofer, and then some of the other folks that I referenced there, this is their materials. These are not things that I've developed, but I want to elevate, you know, other creators here who've done a lot of work to really generate that. Like, I mean, it, this one is an example, look at how beautiful this picture is. I think just some of the like magical realism elements in the back, and you can kind of see how some of these are created and get some ideas here for words that you might really like based on the style of pictures that you want to create. All right. So I also want to make sure that I'm providing a very balanced perspective because image generations, just like AI tools in general, they're not perfect. They are not silver bullets. They are things that they really need to work through. Many of you, especially if you are very en enthusiastic about AI, like I am, you've probably already heard about the big rumbling tour for an AI image generator over the last week here in Google's Gemini. My actually original intention as a part of this presentation was to spend some time talking about Gemini. Unfortunately, I could not do so because they ended up taking away the image capabilities because of the fact that currently they found with some of the formulas and the trainings that they've done, they were over, they were, they were basically showing people of color in images in image generation context across and like as in instances where it may not actually be factually correct. And I, there was an outrage. There was a lot of just strong reactions to this fact. I will say from my perspective, even AI tools that are not over amplifying you know, people of color in the same way, they still have biases as well. And I'm actually highlighting some of these on these slides. So I just find it very interesting that that outrage happened in this particular constant, but not in this one where some of these tools continue to be biased as well. So none of these are perfect. Don't take anything you get at face value. Make sure that you are really continuing to interrogate that. I think that's helpful advice when you think about text to text as well as text to image as well. Though the nice thing about text to image is visually, you can usually kind of see when biases or stereotypes or like just errors are up because it's with our eyes, it's sometimes a little bit easier than what it is with text. But that being said, four of the biggest drawbacks I would name as you were doing this. Number one, most roles, especially if you're using chat GPT and let me, and mind you, like I've already said, Chad GPT is still my favorite tool to use, but it isn't perfect. Most of the time when you are being very vague about your roles, especially if it's a role that is like of authority, of power, of success, it is going to generate a white guy. Like nine out of 10 times, probably 10 out of 10. As an example here, I put generate a successful person. Now, granted that response is a little bit broad, but I, if you sit there and you run it 10 times, it's probably going to generate a white guy every single time. Right? So just be aware of that. If, if, if it doesn't actually matter for the message or the way you're using a visual element, that's cool. That's fine. You can use that picture. You may actually really like it. It may still try to convey your point. But if you are in a, a situation where having diversity represented, making people feel seen that you're presenting to is critical, then you need to be explicit about that in the context of that. Now, that being said, there can be some drawbacks to that too, because as you can see here for another picture, sometimes because of the fact that these models are not as well trained for uh, people of color, and then they're they are they are made mostly by white males, so there's a lot more training examples and training data 
for those populations of people, it can lead to some implicit biasing or stereotyping. As an example, when I generated this prompt here of generate a film still photograph of a Hispanic high school student opening an acceptance letter to college and celebrating, that was the prompt I put, you can kind of see the image you gave me. So again, not like overtly offensive picture, but like anybody who's an Hispanic person, myself included, you see that like, yo, we don't have the, the, the traditional Hispanic blanket 45 times represented in our house throughout our entire house. Right. And so I've seen it, uh, similar images represented for different populations of people as well. So it's still working through some of that. So I just want to be explicit. I think it's very important to be explicit about some of these things because these tools aren't perfect. They're really great. And there's a lot of things, but there are some things that you have to like be aware and be uh, vigilant of as well. On the more technical side of this, if you generate images with multiple humans, unless you really are explicit about ways to call out, sometimes you'll notice some of those pictures will look very distorted or all the people look the same. It'll be like 20, it'll be like 12 people there. They may even like represent different racial diversity or age, but then they all have still have the exact same face. So you'll notice that as well. So just be mindful of that. If you are trying to create images with multiple people, that can happen. And then finally, as you'll notice in the picture in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, Pretty much every AI, AI tool I've used, none of them have really, I think, figured out the consistency of the word thing yet. The word thing has been very tough. I will say that over the last year, it has gotten a lot better. When I was first using tools like Dolly 2, which is essentially what ChatGPT is now, last year around this time, it really sucked with generating words accurately. But now if you at least are explicit in your prompt and you say, hey, I want you to put the words AI education in this, and then you put like quotes around them and you say, this is how it's spelled. I actually find that most of the time it'll do that right. It's just, if it includes any other words around it, or if you're not explicit about how to spell it and the words are in there, a lot of times it may do something like in the picture I had there where I was talking about an AI financial aid workshop and you could see it very, it like put some Aboriginal characters or misspelled some words and it did some of that. So it could just happen. So just, again, things to be aware of. It doesn't mean don't use the tools. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, you can't use these. It's just, these tools aren't perfect. And these are some of the most common problems that I'm noticing when I'm using these tools here. And again, just feel free as we're walking through some of these initial table setting to, to put some more questions in the chat here if anything else is coming up for you. I know I'm going through a little bit, of, a little bit of talking points here. I wanted to talk about the last use case that I would highly recommend this for. So if you'll recall just quickly, we talked about two so far. Visual elements. So as you can see throughout this, almost every picture I posted is an AI-generated picture. So I'm using a whole lot of visual elements. And then the second is around team building. You can think of really creative, fun questions to ask people on a team, have them all generate an AI generated image, and then you can share it. So what I would actually do with that, what's your spirit animal question, if I was doing that with my team, and you're welcome to do that, you know, in your next team meeting, your icebreaker, I would highly encourage you to do that. Have everybody generate a picture around it, and then have everybody share the picture. Give everybody a couple of minutes, give them 30 seconds to share the picture. Just a really fun way, change it up, do something different, all develop our AI proficiency. And then finally, I want to talk about assessments because I think that there's a lot of way that you can assess learning using visual tools. Now, when I say assessment, I don't necessarily always mean like assessing in the context of a standardized test or a very robust comprehensive test. You may still need that. Visual elements may not be able to help, but I think visual elements can be really great for checks for understanding. They can be great for exit tickets. They can be great uh, team experiencing activities to check people's learning if you're presenting something. Let's say that you're doing a large data workshop for a team that you lead and you're like, hey, we're going to spend the whole day talking about data. Maybe maybe as a way to break that up, you let anyone, everyone generate an image and you ask them like, how does this, like with, with what you're noticing about the data or how you're feeling about our results or what it means, like what's an image that you would use to describe how you're feeling right now? And that's a way that you can just break up the day a little bit, invite conversation, get people to think about it in different ways and using higher level learning there. Just as a quick example, when I, I had the opportunity over the last year to do a pretty uh, rigorous fellowship with the National College Attainment Network, it's a it's a it's a fellowship intended for you know aspiring chief level leaders who want to be you know lead, modeling and leading college access organizations and within five years. And so that was a fellowship I had the opportunity to be a part of. I was with this very small group of about fifteen people going through this year long fellowship, and it was a really great experience. And at the end, the facilitator essentially said, "Hey, you can." I want you to basically have do a 10 minute presentation about like some of your major learnings over this experience and you can do it whatever way you want. And so the way that I chose to do it was through AI generated images. I actually just generated five images and I explained what each one meant. 
that's the way that I, I demonstrated my learning. And just to give you a quick preview of two of the things that I learned and that I shared on the picture to the right there, I essentially talked about how one of the most critical skills for a chief level leader is, is thinking about any of the spaces that they're in within three uh, specific lenses, which is uh, your team culture, your financial sustainability and your impact. And so you can kind of see there how that picture represents like scales, trying to balance all of those lenses and thinking about some of the trade-offs associated there. So again, that was just the way that made sense for me. It helped me to contextualize my learning and like make sense of it for me. And that was the way that I was able to present. And then on the left there, that was a picture I used to show like all the different tools that can be really helpful when you're navigating change management on a team or in an organization. And so I put it just a quick bucket there if you're curious about what different things in that picture represented and how I thought of them. But these are examples. These are things that you could do with your team. You know, if you are using things like Canva, if you're using tools like that and you have access to tools like that in your school, you could potentially be using these with students as well. Now, granted, as uh, we hopefully all know, the acceptable use agreement for a lot of these tools is 13 or older. So you may have to think a little bit of creatively about how you use these with the younger grades, you know, if at all, or maybe you you find a way to send home a letter to parents and have them generate an AI image at home and you teach the students how to prompt and then they bring it to class one day and then they share it. So I think that there's ways that we can do this and bring some of the powers of AI generated messages. The last thing I wanted to just say about why I think assessments can matter here is and and why this can be a valuable practice just in the event that you're still wrapping your head around like, well, why would I even want to use it at that? I think from my perspective, when I think about what an assessment is intended to do, it's intended to do two things, right? It's intended to make sure somebody knows something. And then it's also intended to make sure that I understand that they know what they were supposed to know. Fundamentally, that's what an assessment is, right? That's what we're trying to do. So what I learned early on in my uh, teaching career is that one of the most powerful principles you can use in this experience to help students, and I'm talking about students just uh, for a minute here, to not only think very critically, but also contextualize their learnings so that they will remember some of these concepts when they walk out of class. And it's not just something I talk about for five minutes, but right over the head and they don't care. And they get to personalize their learning is this principle of what's called juxtapositioning. And the way that it was explained to me is by really getting uh, kids to think very critically about concepts that we normally wouldn't put together. So as an example, one time during one of my class periods as an English teacher, I asked my students to write, do a quick write around the, the following question. What color is Wednesday? Right. And they basically were very creatively intended to think about, well, what, you know, when I'm thinking about the, the Wednesday, what it you know, in that day of the week, the feelings associated for me, what color might I pick? And then being able to connect it to and explain why. That's very high level thinking, though it, it it may not be aligned to like regurgitating back specific concepts. You are having to take two concepts and draw connections between those two things that don't totally make sense. And when we think also just about higher level intelligence, is that not what we want people to be doing too in discourse and conversations like across the board? It's like, People, when you when you are in higher level jobs, when you are uh, navigating very complex problems, you have to be able to hold the complexity of truths that sometimes can be very contradictory, right? This thing could also be true and this thing could also be true. And it's like, yeah, sometimes they don't always align fully, but that's just like the reality of, of the situation. And so being able to put students in that situation where they have an opportunity to juxtapose concepts, I think AI image generation is a fantastic format to do that. You can, I, I could easily see if I was back in the classroom doing the same exact lesson, what color is Wednesday, but then asking students to maybe explain, or I, I maybe could open the prompt further and say, when you think of Wednesday, how would you describe it? Let them generate a picture to describe what that looks like. And then explain the picture. What does that mean to you? Maybe write a couple of sentences, how, like ex explain to me your picture so I understand what it means for you. And so those are some things I, I think you could do to really capture assessment, to make it fun. So it's not the same five paragraph essay or the same multiple choice, the same graphic organizer, those same like outputs we're so used to using to generate outputs. And the student is more engaged. They get to create a picture. They get to do something fun. Now, just as a quick plug here, I would also say if your school or uh, organization is having some real barriers to uh, being able to use AI image generated tools like the ones that I present, uh, a big shout out to a consultant that I recently had a conversation with named Tom Mullaney. I'm going to be posting uh, his episode on the AI education conversation in a couple of weeks, but he actually elevated this tool called AutoDraw that I had never heard of before, which is you know really a, a highly ethical AI tool. The intention is to be very similar to like an AI image generation, but it actually allows you to draw on a touch screen. But the way that it, it uses AI is you could put something like a line in a circle and then it'll actually use AI generation 
generated training to come up with some images that it thinks you're trying to draw. So especially for more developmental kids who are still trying to work through like their coordination and motor skills that, or they, you know, they're, they're not great at drawing. You could put something like a stick and a couple of other legs. And then it may know that it's like, you're trying to draw a person and then you can click on a person that somebody has actually submitted to that as an example, and then it'll give a template. And so it, it kind of scaffolds the drawing experience. If you would rather go that route over typing some words and, and producing an image that way. So I think the that also feels like a really cool way to get students really excited about personalizing, contextualizing their learning or an icebreaker. And just as an example, again, that tool is called AutoDraw, just in case you're interested in checking it out. All right. I already talked a little bit about what this could look like. I actually modeled that. So just, you know, I'll, I'll leave that slide there. So when you get that slide deck, if you're thinking of ways you could use this. And, and again, I would say fun, uh, fun fact, the beauty of some of these AI tools is you can also ask it right? How can I use these tools? So if you're a different role, if you're a consultant, if you're a school leader, if you're a chief officer, if you are a counselor, you can even say, hey, I, I'd like to incorporate AI generated images in my next lesson or, or you know, throughout my, my workflows. How can I do it? Give me five ideas for how I can do it. So if you're not sure how to do it yet, ask. You can, you can ask that as well and you can think through that stuck on ideas. I showed this as well. So I just put a couple of screenshots here so that you can kind of see how I did that. When you go that back that later, you're welcome to share this with folks. So uh, I was able to model that. I would like to end uh, our time together with a quick AI challenge. So my hope is at this point, you all feel like you have understood and are taking away some really great steps, tactics, for how to generate AI images and apply them in your day-to-day -day work. Hopefully we have achieved our outcome for the day. And the way that I will assess that is back on that very same Jamboard. And if you need that link again, you need the, the QR code. I would love for you to now generate an image based on one takeaway or multiple takeaways that you are taking away from the session, just in the spirit of modeling use case number three. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd actually love to see what you all come up with. And I'm going to leave this slide here briefly. I'll go back to that slide, but I also want to mention, I'm going to give this slide to you as well. It just includes a link with a lot of decks and resources. If you are, if you got the bug like I do, and you love generating AI images, you want to get really good at it. You want to get even better at generating them. I put a lot of different resources there, ways we can connect, ways that we can you know, continue to collaborate as we all learn and, and, sh and sharpen our AI proficiency. But that being said, I'm going to go back to this. If you all wouldn't mind, let's take a little bit of time, just two or three minutes to generate those images, drop them in that jam board, and we'll close out there. So I'm going to just give us a couple minutes there, and then we'll come back here. So let me just get a little song going here. Hey, Daniel, I do have a question for you. Yes. You may have touched on this, but what do you think about the, the new video generator that OpenAI was released last week, and what are the implications behind that? What do you think? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I will say that, okay, good. I'm happy to hear that, Shannon. I mean, I will say that my initial reaction when I saw Sora in particular, and and mind you, there are a couple of other text-to-video tools out there already, things like Pika uh, that exist that aren't as well-known, but do something similar. But I, I mean, I got really excited when I saw the videos. I know that if you talk to people that have a really trained eye, they weren't as impressed by it because they said anatomically or lighting wise, some of the things looked wonky. But just for me, who's not like a Pixar creative and somebody who knows how to do all that in a very sophisticated way, the idea that now when I have creative ideas about how to do something, I could use my words to generate something that like might be 65% as good as what a, a really talented master, you know, graphic designer could use. That felt very exciting for me. I definitely am eagerly awaiting for Sora to come out so that I can think through a lot of the applicable use cases for there. But I will say that my initial thought is a lot of the same use cases we just talked about here could apply, right? Where it's like now, instead of generating an assessment based on one image, maybe a student could actually generate a five second video to demonstrate something that they're learning and they're excited about. I think you could easily use those for icebreakers as well. So a lot of, I think some of my initial thoughts around images very much apply to that text to video. And I'm very excited to, to just get my hands on using it. I think Sora seems like it could be be an additional game changer. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think there will be drawbacks just like there are with these tools. The biggest thing I continue to be hyper concerned about related to just our ramped up video capacity and audio is just around deep fakes. I have multiple episodes around AI deep fakes, so I'm not going to get on my soapbox right now and talk deep fakes, but I, I do think it's a problem that we all need to be keeping our eye on. I would also recommend anyone listening to this recording, be extremely mindful about pictures you are uploading of yourself, your family, 
your friends on social media unless you and, and just be aware right that those can be used to train ai video ai audio tools so just be very thoughtful about that any single time you make the decision to post those things if you have children like i do you need to also think very critically about whether or not you do want your your children to have social media accounts and whether or not like the types of images you are okay with them uploading onto social media for the exact same reasons. So that that would be like the cautionary side of some of this. And I think there's still a lot to unpack there. Like I said, I have some episodes on that, but the technology, when you see some of those videos, I mean, I was very excited and I think I could definitely see some really fun use cases that just make learning more fun, which I think is the whole point. Awesome. This has been amazing. And I already see like three or four new podcasts. I, we're going to have to do a triplicate. <laughs> we didn't get into how they're, they designate, how they're determining right now. Deep fakes, they use your veins in your face are actually unique, almost like fingerprints in your, you know, veins and arteries in terms of the blood flow. And so that's what they're using. There's a certain term, I can't even pronounce it, but I was like, oh my, <laughs> like we have gone yeah. way too deep. I don't want to go down in the water. We got four minutes left. We, we'll start a whole new podcast right here. <laughs> we, we might have to, because again, I have so like the amount of content around deep fakes that I am just sitting on that I have not like gone on air yet and like done episodes on is just ash because so many things continue to come out. Like, and it's, it is just astounding. And like I said, I think the best advice I could offer in the very limited space I have is just be hyper mindful about what you share on social media. I think if you do that one thing, you're doing a great job at like being more vigilant compared to like someone who's not learning as much about these tools. And anytime you consume something on social media, be hyper vigilant about what you're consuming and don't take it at face value, right? Because the recipe of consuming things within 30 seconds and deepfakes is not a good recipe, right? Because we will not be looking at those things closely. Oftentimes when we're looking at social media, we're looking real fast and then we're scrolling. So be very careful. But again, I don't want to totally end on that. My hope is that, you know, this felt very exciting and there's a lot of fun ways. I think you you could see this learning happening there. I will say just as some, some one-off fun examples too, that, you know, I've heard people using some of my episodes, like in a recent episode I dropped with uh, the CEO of Innovate Edu, Erin Moat, she talked about how she was able to generate an AI generated Harry Potter diorama, like type inspired image for like a class project with her child at home. So I think that feels like <laughs> a really cute. fun way to do like a project that you're with your child that uses AI generated images. I know that I had an opportunity to talk to jo uh, Dr. James Hudson really around art and content creation a couple months ago. And he talked about how oftentimes with his son, his, his son will get ideas about a new Pokemon he wants to create. And he's like, I want him to be like an ice dragon and breathe purple and all these things and he'll actually use these to like help his son create like a, a visual for what this like pokemon or creature could look like and so there's a lot of fun ways to to use these things and be creative and you just gotta you just gotta be vigilant about how you're using the tools but it, it is very fun it's very exciting and it, i think it's a game changer i call it cautious advocacy so i'm yes. a cautious advocate you sound like you're a cautious advocate as well this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Yes, please. I see your contact information. I'm going to stop the recording and then we are Ooh, going that to. That tree is beautiful. I love that tree. I know that is. That's awesome.